and welcome back to episode 18 of the Detours in Music podcast. I'm Laura Rupel, and today we have a really great interview with musicologist John Gibson from the JMU School of Music. Enjoy. I am John Gibson, and I'm professor of musicology at JMU. Awesome. Can you talk about your start in music? Uh, yes. I... I was always involved in ensembles growing up. I was a band kid and a choir kid and an everything kid and a rock band kid. And um, I never really planned to do that um, as a career, Mm -hmm. but I always knew it would be a big part of my life. So I was in like every ensemble in high school there was, and it was just what I did because I wanted to do it. Mm -hmm. And there was other stuff I did that I thought would be more of kind of a career path. Mm-hmm. but I, but I always knew, yeah, I would, I would be doing music forever in whatever capacity. Yeah. Awesome. Um, when do you think you had the shift in mindset about making music your career? I know exactly when it was <laughs> down, <laughs> down to the week. Uh, so when I went to call to undergrad, I was a biology major Okay. Um, because biology was kind of my, in, in academics was my first love. I, okay. Like I loved and still love biology. It was just kind of clicked with me. I did well in it and I wanted to be a doctor basically. Okay. okay. Um, so I declared a double major with music just because I was going to be doing music anyway. I was a French horn player. And, and so I even in college I was in, I think I was in up to six or seven ensembles at a time. Wow. Uh, just w- including chamber ensembles. So I I was using, uh, all of my extra time was going into ensembles anyway. So I'm like, oh, I may as well have a music major also, take some theory, music history, whatever. Exactly. Um, so I declared a double major with music as kind of the secondary major with biology and music. And that lasted about a year and a quarter. Okay. Until a chemistry class that was kicking my butt. Mm -hmm. Um, I always really loved biology and never did well in chemistry, even in high school. So I knew that would be an issue, but I was sitting there spending, um, you know, 80% of every week on chemistry. Uh, Mm -hmm. It just never came naturally to me and um, realized one day I didn't want to be spending all of my days that way. And I didn't see that getting better. Mm -hmm. So I had a bunch of conversations, and again, this was probably around the end of fall semester, sophomore year. Okay. I'd ha- and I had had, um, I have three older sisters, um, and the two oldest ones, one is a musician and one is a doctor, so I kind of was following their paths as well. <coughs> so I, ca- I called both of them and talked to them, and I called my parents and I talked to them, especially my mother, and I had... Uh, really great conversation and you know my mom actually said you know forget everything else what like picture yourself in like 10 or 15 years Mm -hmm. picture yourself really happy what are you doing yeah and I had never thought in those terms before I don't know why but um, I had always thought in terms of okay what are my career choices and Mm -hmm. instead of you know picture yourself happy one day long from now and it was really clear that I was doing music. Mm, that's nice. <laughs> uh, yeah. And so that week I dropped the chemistry major and I dropped my chemistry class. I um, mean, it, it must not have been that close to the end of the semester because I wouldn't have been able to do that. It was probably mid semester. Okay. Um, I dropped the chemistry class and every day during that chemistry class, I walked past that building just so I could enjoy not being in there. Yeah. (laughs) And it was, yeah, this moment of clarity. I didn't know yet what I wanted to do in music. Um, Mm -hmm. But oddly, there was never a moment of like, there was never a frightening moment like, oh, like, what am I going to do with this? Um, Mm -hmm. That didn't occur to me. Um, Yeah. Yeah. One thing I guess that I can relate to is I think sometimes growing up in such a strong music world that almost majoring in music or becoming a musician can seem like like we don't want to say yes to that it's like no I can do something different um like I don't know it can make you feel better at least to say that you're not doing music for a little bit and then you kind of realize like oh no I am exactly what I yeah yeah, yeah. I am doing what everyone thought I would do so sure you yeah you want to chart your own path and yeah yeah 
Yeah. Um, going from high school or going from college when you switched your major, what school were you at? I was at the University of Richmond. Okay, cool. In undergrad, yeah. Um, and then about when did you fall in love with music history? <laughs> Not till much later. Okay. Um, I did that not sense. have, <laughs> that didn't happen during undergrad. Yeah. Um, well, it happened at the, I, I guess it happened at the very, very end of undergrad. Mm -hmm. um, I, you know, frankly, I was, I was like a lot of my students now who don't really see the connections, don't really see the relevance. And, uh, you know, I, w I was a pretty serious French horn player. Um, at first, I was a horn performance major, and that was, you know, I was in the practice room as, until my lips fell off every day, um, and I understand that. Mm -hmm. It's your fingers, though, in your case. Yeah. I um, but, um, yeah, I mean, I was, I saw that, I, I saw that music history and music theory as something that took away from that. It took mm -hmm. away time that I could be in the practice room. It took away time from other things I wanted to do. I kind of bought that there was some con some connection in order to be like, in order to consider myself a musician, I should know some stuff probably. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But that was about as far as it went. We had 8 a.m. music history classes at Richmond also. And I am not and will never be and have never been a morning person. So um, I can completely, I, I, you know, I actually think that's one thing that helps me relate to and not get just mad at students, at my students now, because I completely get it, because yeah. <laughs> I was that. And I, I mean, I, there were several times I woke up in class with my music history professor looking at me. Yeah. It wasn't because I was trying to be a jerk. It was just because, yeah. you know, I drank a cup of coffee and a Mountain Dew on the way to class, and that was the best I could do. Yeah, and, yeah. And I wasn't interested. So, so your question is, when did that happen? Um, probably in in the big. I took a gap year after undergrad. Okay. Uh, probably around the beginning of that year is when I started to know that's what I wanted to do. Okay. Were you, you know, doing like your own research type of stuff? Yeah. So I. So I. Um, so I, at first I thought, well, I'm going to be a horn player. I'm just going to audition for orchestras. I'm going to, you know, live that life. Mm -hmm. um, I, I probably, in retrospect, I, I'll, I'll never know. I probably wasn't good enough to do that, frankly. Um, I also uh, kind of started realizing, thinking about the life that that is. Uh, I think I started thinking that that might not be the most secure um, life or the type of life that I, I wanted. So I was looking at other options. So I changed from performance to music ed. Okay. Um, even though I, I wasn't really passionate about that, that probably wasn't a great move. It was just kind of thinking, oh, there's more jobs here. I don't mm -hmm. Probably isn't true, but I thought it was. Mm -hmm. um, and I did, I student taught um, instrumental uh, you know, I, I student taught middle school and high school band. Okay. And the student teaching experience really clarified. I mean, I really enjoyed it and mm -hmm. learned a lot. It clarified that's not what I wanted to do. Yeah. I actually, I didn't know what I did want to do. I had one interview at the end of senior year, um, and I was for a band position. I was the runner-up for that position. And in retrospect, I'm really, really glad I didn't get it. Mm -hmm. And I shouldn't have gotten it because the person who got it was super passionate about it and that's what they wanted to do. Mm -hmm. um, so at that point I started thinking about, um, I had always thought I might want to go into conducting, okay. into or orchestral conducting, so I thought well this is what I want to do. At the same time actually throughout senior year I was more and more convinced that's what I wanted to do. So I was talking to our orchestra conductor. We had an, an interim conductor while our conductor was on sabbatical. Mm -hmm. So I was talking to him a lot. And so I went to one orchestral conducting audition. Um, at, uh, so you have to send in videos and stuff to get the audition. Mm -hmm. And I had done some conducting. I mean, I conducted our orchestra a little bit. And um, I, mean, I think I was as good as I could have been at that with, without any real experience. Mm -hmm. I went to an audition at Peabody and there were like, 
I think there were 45, 55 auditionees and they were taking two people. So I, I'm sure I didn't even almost get that. Mm -hmm. um, and they were all a lot older and stuff. And I, I didn't really know what that world was about. I didn't know what I was getting into. Mm -hmm. um, but around that same time, I started thinking, okay, well, what is that life like? You know, mm -hmm. yeah. like, what is this? I'm trying to get it, trying so hard to get into. Yeah. Um, and realized that, you know, I, I'm not sure I want to have my face buried in scores. And um, I'm not sure, I, again, I didn't, I've been really, really bad throughout my life about realizing what I'm passionate about. You know, everyone says, follow what you're passionate about and what yeah. you love. It's kind of hard to tell sometimes. Yes, I agree. <laughs> yeah, or it was for me at least. Yeah. So, um, in the beginning of that, I, I worked for for a newspaper just as a you know bill paying job for a year, mm -hmm. and started thinking about about musicology pretty seriously, and started realizing that a lot of the things that musicology were about I had always really liked. Again, never dreamed that that would be what I did. Mm -hmm. I'd always, um, not always, I had kind of been realizing I had this kind of interest in scholarship and mm -hmm. starting to see myself as that kind of person. Um, so yeah, I mean, I applied to some schools and um, I took that gap year mm -hmm. to really immerse myself into that. I actually wrote a paper <laughs> and, and that's when I, that's, and it's a long answer to your question, but that's when yeah. I fell in love with it. Yeah. When I wrote a paper, not because anyone was telling me to, mm -hmm. but because it was something I was interested in. I, I wrote a, did research on microtonal music, on like 20th century microtonal music. And I went and met one of the main composers, Ben Johnson in North Carolina and hung out with him for a while and um, read a bunch of books. And that was my first experience, like reading stuff that had nothing to do with school. This is mm -hmm. the, the idea that you can read something like a book on music just because you were interested in it yeah i don't know why it never occurred exactly. to me and i sat down and i started writing like for no reason and mm -hmm. um and i wrote this paper and i submitted it to grad schools that's in musicology that's one of your main things is you mm -hmm. submit papers and i got in a bunch of places so i went awesome yeah i think um the concept of like noticing when you're actually really passionate about something or the work doesn't feel like work. Um, for example, like this capstone project for a lot of people um, is really daunting, including for myself. Um, and the options they give you are all like research based. Um, they allow for creative, but even the creative projects are probably not that interesting, at least when I looked at them. Mm. Um, and then I thought back of my four years at school and I was like, oh, what was the one project or like what are projects that I was able to fulfill without getting annoyed by it or like feeling like I actually did my best. And I had to do a podcast for a writing class my freshman year um, that went really well. And so that's like what I brought to this and then it's turned out well. So um, not to say that I won't ever enjoy a research paper, but um, I just knew like if I did that for this, it wouldn't be the, the best I could do. Um, yeah, sure. Um, I mean, so you're, I mean, you're, you and frankly, a lot of undergrads are ahead of where I was at that. I was just not very self-aware and. Um, we probably was, aren't either. <laughs> no, I don't know. We uh, might look more prepared. Do you think now if you weren't a musician, you would still be in the science field? I think so. I think that's probably the other, that was the other path. And I, you know, it's been, I look back on all the choices that, you know, on the path, if you want to think of that metaphor. Um, and I think about all the kind of twists and turns and at every stage when I, when I look back now with kind of clarity of how I would not have been happy doing so many of the things that I was trying so hard doing. Yeah. And, and it's kind of like, why wasn't that clear then? Like I, mm -hmm. did I not know anything about myself? And, yeah. and, and I, you know, I have plenty of family members who are doctors and it, it's great. And I, I, again, the, the science part of it, I love, um, mm -hmm. but realizing what, what, the, those days are like those mm -hmm. days and nights and days and nights and be on call and all of this um, in some fields at least and sometimes in you know 
with like surgery, doing the same procedure many, many times every day. Like my job now, I, every semester is different. Mm -hmm. like students are different every couple of years and everything changes all the time. Mm -hmm. And I didn't realize I really need that. So, so yes, I think I would have gone probably into medicine. Mm -hmm. And I think I probably would have been happy, but probably not as happy. In your undergrad, you struggled, I guess, a little bit with knowing which major you wanted and then what type of concentration you wanted to prepare you for the future. Um, is there something else that you would say you had trouble with? Uh, well, I don't know. I guess I, guess I was a pretty typical undergrad at, you know, laziness. <laughs> There's that. Yeah. Um, other than that, I don't know. It, w it was really just a, a figuring out. I wish someone had said to me, like, what, like, what, what is it you, what is it you would do if you didn't have any schoolwork? And, you know, I, you know, after you're bored of, you know, playing video games and doing nothing and, you know, going for a run or whatever, what is it that when you have to come back to do something just because you want to, what is that? Mm -hmm. um, and, and no one really said that to me. And I think, um, yeah, it took me a, a long time to figure all that out, but I had a great experience. It, it's not like it was, um, I loved undergrad mm -hmm. for great uh, years. So it wasn't painful figuring all those things out. I was just mm -hmm. I feel like in retrospect, I was stumbling around in the dark a little bit. Yeah. What's some advice you either hear yourself saying a lot to students at JMU or um, just advice for younger musicians? Mm. Uh, I was, so I was a freshman advisor for seven okay. years in the honor, for the honors program. Okay. Um, so, so I'm thinking your question makes me think of that and things I found myself saying to incoming freshmen a lot who were a lot of whom were were undeclared and some some of I really liked it when I saw someone undeclared mm -hmm. <laughs> um, but a lot of them were worried about that and trying to figure stuff out and I I mean I honestly I, I gave the same advice that I asked the same questions that my mom way back when mm -hmm. asked like what do you you know figure out what it is you're passionate about and and what life you want to lead and think in ter terms of, in those terms, instead of saying, okay, mm -hmm. um, these are the, you know, these are the, you know, 30 careers that I can envision yeah. myself having, choose one. I, I think that doesn't work so well because really when I, when I was, you know, 18, 19, 20, 21, I, I didn't really know enough about what what those careers were. I, yeah. I thought in terms of what those careers are kind of about instead of what life you lead when you are those things. What life do you lead when you're a conductor? What life do you lead when you're a concert pianist? What life do you lead when you're a band teacher, mm -hmm. a doctor, or, what, or, or whatever? So I knew I wanted to have a family. That was really important to me. I knew I wanted to have time for my family. That Even as an undergrad, I knew that was going to be really important for me. Um, so, so I think that's important, you know, picturing yourself really happy in 10 years mm -hmm. and not necessarily what career do you have, but what kind of, what is, what does your Thursday look like? You know, yeah. what is your, um, and, and the funny thing was that when my mom asked me that question, I knew instantly, not only that it was music, but it, that it was college music. Mm -hmm. Like I, I had never thought of that before, mm -hmm. but she, she said, where do you see yourself? And I'm like on a college campus, probably um, mm -hmm. that, that would make me really happy. And she had never heard me say that. I had never even thought that, mm -hmm. um, but she was yeah. right. <laughs> <laughs> we can surprise ourselves sometimes with the right questions. I yeah, think. sure. Sure. In your professional life, have you ever considered changing your career path? And this could also be like focus, um, which sure. is probably more likely. Um, once I, so I guess you're saying after grad school and all that, mm -hmm. not really. Mm -hmm. um, I'm, I've been too happy to, I, I mean, I, I basically, 
you know, my colleagues and I talk about this a lot when we're having bad days or when you're, you're reading a, a paper from a student who isn't trying, it's, it's easy to get mired in the negative. And sometimes you just have to pinch yourself and say, look, I get to spend my days <laughs> doing like talking to people about music. Like that is, so really every day is kind of a pinch yourself day. Mm -hmm. really when you think about it um in, in when you get really specific there i mean in in terms of like musicological focus i'm in the middle of a shift right now okay i think i've even talked about that a little bit in our class that um uh, my specialty is 17th century french rhetoric treatises and i know that sounds really really interesting but <laughs> But I, you know, I published on that. Uh, I just came off a really, really long article, like an 80-page article that wow. that um, took a lot out of me. And I'm, for a little while, I'm kind of done with that. And mm -hmm. right now, I'm going more into a secondary area. And I don't know what whether it's going to be like a a little break and a breath of fresh air. Mm -hmm. Um, or whether it's going to be something I work on for years, and it's and the the new area is stuff like we're talking about in class. Yeah, would you say that your musical detour, I guess, was deciding to go into musicology? Uh, yeah, there were a bunch of them. Okay. I I guess not. Uh, I, I guess first going to music, then deciding not to go into. Not, uh, deciding to go into education instead of performance, yeah. then in, to go into conducting instead of education, then to go into musicology instead of, uh, of, uh, of conducting. And even after that, in, mm -hmm. when you go into grad school for musicology, you have to ultimately decide on a focus, on a really specific focus, you know, to do your re research in. And then again, I didn't, I, I, I knew I wanted to study either contemporary music or renaissance music and I was wrong in both counts and I don't I d it didn't occur to me until about the end of second year grad school that the music I had always loved that the, the music that really you know when you play something and it 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 just has like it gives you goosebumps and has like visceral reactions mm -hmm those pieces were mostly Baroque pieces. It was like Bach and Handel and stuff. And that's the music that had always done it for me. It just never occurred to me that, well, I can specialize yeah. in that. Yeah. I guess the, the other thing I would say is, I, I think detours is an interesting way of thinking about it. I think for myself, I probably wouldn't call, a detour to me kind of implies that you leave a path and then come back to like the the path eventually, and I never really came back to any of those things. It was more for me like a like like branching paths, and you follow this one, mm -hmm. and you never go back to that other one. Mm -hmm. so, so, so with my own kind of evolution, it was more of that. Yeah, um, I guess. Can you talk a little bit about your what brought you to JMU and then your, what you do every day? Like what's your Thursday? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, so what brought me to JMU was a job opening. Mm -hmm. um, the job market in, in, um, in musicology, like a lot of academic music is, is not really great. So you basically um, apply to just about every job that's open mm -hmm. and you kind of go, go where you go. It's, it's almost unthinkable to get a job and turn it down in my field. Okay. Um, and and the way it was explained to me is you, you can you can pick a couple of places that you really don't want to live, like maybe a couple of states or something, uh, but you can't really pick a couple of states where you're going to focus and only apply to those jobs. That just doesn't work out. So, so I applied to every job out there and. Um, there was a one-year job at JMU right at the time I was finishing, and I knew JMU because my um, my sister um, Joy Anderson, who you know, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, she um, her family already lived here, mm -hmm. and we had been here. And again, I was at University of Richmond, so I um, my wife and I had uh, had you know hiked and camped out here in Western Virginia a lot. So we th we saw that and we're like, wow, that would be you know amazing. So I got the one year job and then applied for the full time job and and that happened. So um, 
it was kind of for me a dream job yeah. out of the gate which doesn't usually happen it's usually like the third job is the dream job if, yeah. if it's the dream job um so what a day is like they're all different which mm -hmm. is really what i like in in um college teaching you basically the way it's usually described you do three things you do your own research or your own activity whether it's scholarship or performing mm -hmm. and you do your service like committee meetings and stuff and you do teaching mm -hmm. and the type of school you end up at determines the balance of those at jmu it's pretty even if 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 i had gone to like a research one school um it would be very research heavy and you might teach, you know, one or two classes a year. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, you know, there are other schools where you, it's all teaching, you don't, you don't do any research. So I really like the balance. Um, basically day to day, uh, of course, now it's different. I, yeah. I guess we're, we're talking pre pandemic, right? Yes. Uh, during the semester, it's basically teaching and then getting ready for the next day of teaching is, mm -hmm. Um, in most semesters, like 70% of your day. Mm -hmm. That makes and, sense. Yeah, especially if you're teaching a, a new prep, a new class, or teaching a class in a really different way. Mm -hmm. It can take, um, like I changed my music history class a lot this past fall, kind of rebuilt it, and I was spending probably eight to 10 hours planning for each class. Wow. Um, so yeah, those are your days. So you're teaching or getting ready to teach, um, and and I usually block off Fridays for research. Okay. Yeah, and, and then when, t when you go into summer, that's when you really hit your research hard. Yeah, that's the last thing I would probably say is that, um, and, and this came up a lot with, uh, with uh, freshman advising, is that like you, you really just, it sounds condescending to say this to like an undergrad, but you mm -hmm. can't know. Yeah. You just can't know. And if you think you know, that's that might be reassuring to you, but it's delusional. Yeah. And that's okay. And that yeah. that's how life works and um and just I was pretty laid back, so that didn't really bother me, but I see sometimes, especially mm -hmm. in the honors program, um people who are really freaked out by mm -hmm. by changing their minds and and I think that can have negative consequences so, cuz someone will someone's you know people were taught to stick finish what you started with and someone sticks yeah. with a major way too long when it's clear to everyone around them it's not for them yeah definitely thank you to dr gibson for that interview um and it's kind of led me to think of this time where we're all isolated <laughs> um on lockdown i guess where we have the time to explore those passions and so with his advice take notice of the things that you're doing on your own and for yourself and try to see if those line up with the life you're trying to lead or the life you may want to lead. Thank you for listening. And as always, you can access the podcast on YouTube, on laurarupeloboe.weebly.com, on Spotify and Apple Music podcast apps, and with the podcast through Instagram, Detours and Music, and through the email, detoursandmusicpodcast at gmail.com. See you next time.